Hello, my scary friends. I'll hunt a werewolf with my crossbow. Be sure to subscribe to my channel. I think the sightings first started up about 10 years ago. That's the same time my family moved to this town. I was only 12 at the time. Since then, many have claimed to have seen some sort of wolf or hyena-like animal running around. Supposedly, it roams the forest right next to our neighborhood at night. I went around and interviewed the eyewitnesses. Every description was the same. They said it has thick brown fur and bright blue eyes. It also has the ability to stand on its hind legs and is about my height when fully upright. These sightings are common enough that even the law enforcement officers believe in this werewolf. They say there are no officially recorded wolves or mountain lions or any other similar animals in this area that could explain the sightings. They've also tried to catch it more than once, but it clearly has human level intelligence, since it has always been able to evade them, and no one knows where it goes during the day. The sightings just seemed to get more and more common as the years flew by, to the point where even my parents had claimed to see it once or twice. My mother says she saw it running across a road while driving home from work late at night, while my father said he saw it creeping around our front yard, before leaping over the fence and running back into the woods where it lurks. Everyone in this town claims to have seen this werewolf at some point dot 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 except for me. I don't believe in the thing. Why should I? Everyone knows eyewitness accounts are the least reliable form of evidence since they can easily be fabricated, exaggerated, or misinterpreted. That said dot 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 just recently, some extremely convincing physical evidence has been found. For instance, some people have photographed large footprints clearly canine in origin, but much larger than that of a fox or coyote. More gruesomely, hikers have been finding carcasses with their necks and spines violently snapped open with powerful bone-crushing jaws. Ever since these deaths turned up, everyone in town has been keeping their pets and livestock indoors at night for safety, especially since the creature seems to be losing its fear of humans, hence the recent sightings of it in urban areas. One of our elderly neighbors even claimed she saw it digging through her garbage right by her window. She says it turned right in her direction, before going over to the window, pressing its muzzle against the glass, and breathing powerful, hungry breaths before she ran to her bedroom, pulled the blanket over her head, and stayed there until morning. After hearing that story, I knew I had to get to the bottom of this. Even if it wasn't a werewolf, there was clearly something in our town wreaking havoc. Maybe a feral dog, or even an escaped hyena that someone was keeping as an illegal exotic pet. I decided I was going to try and catch the creature on film myself, no matter how difficult it would be. I set up a camouflage tent in the backyard, right next to the forest, and brought with me a headlamp, a video camera, and a gun. The latter I brought just in case I needed to defend myself from this animal. I set the camera up on a stand right outside the tent, pointed towards the woods, before crawling into my tent, zipping the door shut, and falling asleep. The next morning, I felt a breeze coming from the front of the tent. I sat up, and nearly had a heart attack when I saw that there was a gigantic hole torn in the tent door. I peeked out of the hole and noticed the chewed up carcass of a turkey lying in front of the tent, along with large paw prints surrounding it. He was here, I thought. I wanted to be excited, but I was mainly terrified. I had been extremely close to being this animal's dinner. The animal had torn open my tent, then for whatever reason, decided I wasn't worthy of a meal. Maybe the videotape will explain everything. 
I hooked the camera up to my computer and uploaded it, before examining the footage. At the very beginning of the video, I saw myself setting the camera up, before stepping out of view to get into the tent. The next hour of footage was unfortunately corrupted for whatever reason, so I skipped ahead another few hours. At approximately 3 am, I saw a big furry wolf-like creature walk out of the woods, its eyes shining brightly in the dark. It was carrying the same dead turkey from before in its jaws. The creature then walked over to the tent, dropped the turkey to the ground, and reared up on its hind legs like a bear. I felt chills run through my skeleton as the animal leaned forward and disappeared completely from the camera. Not only had it torn open my tent, but it had crawled into the tent with me as I was sleeping. I held my breath desperately waiting for the animal to come crawling out of my tent and run back to the woods where it came. But it never did. Instead, as the sun rose up over the backyard, I saw myself climb out through the hole in the tent, walk over to the camera, and shut it off. After the footage was over, I felt anxious and confused. Even though that shot of it entering the tent was out of view of the camera, I'd expect to see some sort of movement from its paws as it tore the tent open. It was as if the opening in the tent was already there when it entered the yard. Had it torn the tent open in the corrupted footage? Also, if it had slept with me in the tent the entire night, how come it wasn't there when I woke up? The footage should have shown it going through the opening, and it's not like there was any other way of leaving the tent. Then it hit me. I suddenly remembered all those mornings where I would wake up with dirty hands and feet for no explainable reason. And those mornings where my breath would smell worse than usual as if I had devoured a whole bunch of rotting meat as a midnight snack. My heart sank. The entire room began to swirl around me as I struggled to stand. All of the pieces were falling into place. Why the creature only appeared at night, while I was sleeping? Why I was the only one in town who had never seen the thing? Why the camera had caught it entering the tent, but not leaving? It turns out, the camera had caught the creature leaving the tent. And that creature was the one who set up the camera in the first place. Where do werewolves sit in the cinema? Anywhere they want to. Be sure to subscribe to my channel. I was always jealous of my best friend, Don. He had life. Great job. Awesome digs nice car. The thing I was the most jealous of was his perfect wife, Tabitha. They had the perfect marriage. Tabitha supported everything he did. Trusted him completely. Was not a spendthrift or high maintenance. She gave other men that stared at her nasty looks and let everyone around her know she was his girl. She cooked amazing food. She was a total bombshell. And he told me, although never giving details, that after going to bed with her, he never wanted to sleep with another woman. We had a bra lunch together, a month ago, and my life changed forever. We met at a local sports bar and had wings and beer. I was cut from work early as I approached overtime. He could leave whenever as long as his quotas were met. Plus, he was acting chief operations officer right now, which made him my boss. I sat down in the booth with him. We talked for about a half hour, demolishing wings, drinking beer, sports, etc. You know you're my only married friend that is okay to do this. Tom and Larry are always like, I have to check with Susan or the kids have baseball games. I said. That's cause they suck. And so do their wives and fake happy lives. You know they're miserable. I go home and my baby is hot and ready. She pushes me to be better. All I have to do is take care of her. He replied. 
Don was always the man. He could act like a tool, but he was right. I didn't want to end up like Larry or Tom. I dreamed of a marriage like Don's. Seven years of marriage and they're running strong. Larry and Tom have been married less long than Don and they wanna kill themselves. Hanging out with them is a bummer. Don wiped his mouth with a napkin. He looked right at me with a smile. I have some good news for you, bro. Yeah? Is another perfect girl out there waiting for a guy like me? He replied, sarcastically. He continued his smile. Tabitha's sister, Rachel, is coming down this weekend. Debbie talked you up to her and she really wants to meet you. So you're coming over tonight. I won't take no for an answer, bro. I was amazed. A little sister of Tabby's wants to meet me? I need to know if this was real. You got a picture of her? I asked. Tabitha said that she didn't want to spoil the surprise by showing you a picture of her. Also, she was right. He began drinking his beer as I sat, perplexed. Right about what? I asked. He put his beer down, took a breath, and said, it is fucking creepy when people ask for pics of people's relatives. We both laughed. I cheer his glass and we finished our drinks. As soon as we parted ways I raced to my apartment. I was excited to meet Rachel. I sang in the shower. I sang while I got ready. I pictured every amazing actress in my head. I pictured a sexier version of Tabitha, if such a woman exists. My phone rang. A number I did not recognize. I answered. Hello, this is Chad. Good afternoon, Chad. This Detective Sam Pearl? Are you an employee of Ethan Davis? He asked. Yes, he's my boss, I replied. I'm calling to inform you that he has been missing for the past five days. His family has become concerned. Any ideas? He has literally vanished. He asked. Ethan was always busy. I saw him twice a month maybe. Horrible boss. Everyone was uptight when he was around. No, detective, I haven't a clue. I hear from him, I'll let you know. He wasn't really well liked if that helps. I've already gathered that much, sir. This case is pretty much a waste of time. To be honest I'm in the middle looking for a missing schoolgirl. If you hear from your boss let me know. We hung up and I thought about Ethan for a second, then back to this mysterious Rachel. I had such high hopes for her. I arrived at Don's right on time with a bottle of the best Merlot I could find. I rang the doorbell. Tabitha answered the door. Chad. Thank you for coming over. It's so good to see you. Coming. Coming. She said while embracing me. She led me to the kitchen where I saw Don chatting with who assume was Rachel. Her back was turned to me. She had beautiful, long, black hair and an amazing figure. Don looked at me, triggering her to look at me. I didn't know anything about love at first sight, but now am I do. She turned around and my heart collapsed. Chad, come over here, bro, said Don. I was literally walking over towards a goddess. Screw Tabitha. At that moment, I knew I would do anything this woman asked me to do. Hi, I'm Rachel. It's nice to meet you, she said, with her hand extended. Even her voice was perfect. In a split second, I imagined bright mornings, waking up next to her in white sheets. Chad. It is nice to meet you too. I wanted to skip all the introductions and embrace her but I kept my swag. We had a bunch in common as we spoke. She had interests that I had never even thought of trying, like crazy shows and backpacking. She thought it was cool that I was side hustling as a poker player and loved casinos as much as I did.
though she preferred blackjack and pay igal. We talked so long, we didn't even notice Abby and Don grabbing their coats. Come on, you two love birds. We have reservations at Mackey's. He declared. Don had a limo waiting outside. We sat down and rode off. He popped a bottle of champagne. What's the occasion, Don? I asked. Well, should be to friends, new and old, but, I am now the new chief operations officer, so. We all raised our glasses congratulating him. We began having a party in the limo. Rachel was already touching me and nestling on my shoulder playfully, but still being a little coy. I loved it. Every moment made me want her more. We arrived at Mackie's steakhouse. As we got out, in display chivalry, he helps Tabby and Rachel out of the limo as Don follow them out. We walked in together and began a conversation with me as we looked at the gorgeous sisters in front of us. Look at those gorgeous ladies, Chad. You bet not cock this up, cause I guarantee you won't find a better woman. I wouldn't dream of it, buddy. I replied. Congrats on the promotion again. I didn't want to bring it up, but Don was promoted to Ethan's old position. So, I did. Speaking of, a detective called me earlier about. Don interrupted me, very casually. Detective Pearl? I know. I was called too. Let's not talk about the stupid brick, Ethan. He probably faked his death to rip somebody off or something. No one liked that maggot anyway. Let's enjoy the night, my friend. I shrugged it off. He was right. In corporate America, when guys like that disappear it benefits society. Fuck him. I got the sexiest woman alive, in an expensive restaurant, with my best friend, who is now my boss. Life is sweet. The night was filled with drinks and good times. We went clubbing and I learned more about Rachel. She's a paralegal. She loves the law. She looks beautiful in anything, and enjoys sexy lingerie. Guys would stare at her and she would move next to me and give them nasty looks like they didn't have a chance. My love and desire for her burned brighter. When we got back to Don's and enjoyed a night capped together by his luxurious outdoor fireplace. I was preparing to leave and she walked me to my car. Hey, I had a great time this evening, she said. At the risk of being vulnerable. Is it possible I can see you tomorrow? I know you're only in town till Sunday. I asked. I would love nothing more, she said as her voice faded while leaning into me. She gave me the most passionate kiss a woman has ever given me. I can't wait until tomorrow. Why don't you? She stopped me with her fingers on my lips and smiled. Not tonight. Not yet. I'll see you tomorrow. She backed up staring at me, turned around and went inside. I was speechless. I got in my car and proceeded down the driveway. I was shuffling music when I looked up and hit the brakes. In the driveway crossed what appeared to be a large wolf. He stopped and looked at me with a large bone in his mouth. The bone was about the size of a human femur. He growled and then moved on. I was worried as I drove home, but then my mind went back to Rachel. I drove home and went to bed. I spent the whole day with Rachel. We met at the marina downtown, got lunch, made out on the water taxi, got ice cream, flirted and played games. We rode the trolley and proceeded back to my place around 6 in the evening. We couldn't hold back any longer. We got hot and heavy. This is not a porno, so like Don says, no deets. We fell asleep in my bed after our activities. I knew I could never sleep with another woman again. I drifted off with head on my chest, wondering if she was a fallen angel.
I awoke to the sound of my apartment door closing. Rachel was gone. I looked at the clock. 12 o'clock. I got up, grabbed my pistol, and went to the door and saw Rachel taking her shoes off. She had a drop of blood running down the side of her lip. I rushed to her. Are you okay? I asked. I placed my gun back in my nightstand. Sorry, I had to leave to go use the ladies room. I'm not comfortable using your bathroom yet. I didn't mean to wake you. You're bleeding. Did some someone hurt you? I asked as I reached for her face. She backed away and wiped her mouth. I'm fine, I promise. I think you bit my lip earlier, she said with her sexy voice. She looked at me with her as she placed her hands on my chest. She ran her fingertips down obs and I was immediately ready for action again. I was worried, but she was probably right. Her hands were touching in a way that my anatomy forced me to let it go. We went back to bed and went to sleep at like 6 in the morning. We slept the morning away and were invited back over to Don and Tabby's Sunday evening. We had a late lunch that I ordered from Uber Eats. I noticed that Rachel does not eat much. I thought that maybe that's the key to maintaining her figure. As we left I saw a crime scene down the alleyway next to my building. There was blood everywhere. The police had it blocked off. Did you see that? I asked Rachel. No, what was it, my love? She said. She called me her love, immediately dismissed it. Nothing, my love. It was nothing. We made it over to Don's around 5 o'clock and enjoyed the weather on his deck. We sipped wine with them and talked about our Saturdays and what the next week had in store. The night approached and it was 10.30. I was feeling good. Okay, ladies it's about that time. You go have your conversation. I need to talk with my man, Chad, in the study. Rachel grabbed me to the side. Chad, I think I'm going to move here and take that parallel job at Don's Midtown branch. We can have lunch together all the time. I can't wait. Tabby and I will be back. Go have fun with Don. Please pay attention though he has something important to talk to you about, darling. They went down the hallway chatting it up. I followed Don to his study. I was so excited about actually having a future with Rachel that I got giddy on the outside. All of a sudden, I had to piss, urgently. Don, I'll be right back. I gotta take a leak. He stopped and looked up the ceiling. Fine. Straight to the bathroom and straight back. We need to talk. He said sternly. I made my way to the bathroom. After my business was concluded, I stepped into the hall. I heard a voice that I recognized coming from down the hall. It was Ethan's voice. I followed the sound to an open door at the end of the hallway. I looked down the steps and saw three silhouettes on the wall. Two of them belonged to the girls and the other was a man in a chair. His silhouette appears to be a stump. No legs no arms. Please, stop eating me. No more, he said. I confirmed that was Ethan's voice. I began to move closer. Before I could get closer, the silhouettes of the girls turned into the shadows of beasts with gigantic teeth and they began devouring Ethan. The shadows were digging into the chest and neck. I stepped back in horror as his screams were silenced. All of a sudden a hand came over my mouth and I was in a chokehold. I couldn't counter the move. I realized it was Don as he told them to be quiet. Don dragged me to his study and threw me on the couch. Don't freak out, dude, he said. I rose up to him and he pushed me back down to the couch. Listen, let me explain. This is what I want to talk about. What the fuck are they? Don? I interrupted. 
he calmed me down and handed me a drink. They're the perfect women with crazy appetites. They are amazing and they love us. They don't eat the partners they choose as long as we take care of them. Listen, this is a lot to absorb I know it was for me when I first met Dabby. You just fed them Ethan, Don. I interrupted. I know, but fuck Ethan. He was a pompous asshole from a long line of pompous assholes. He deserved to be my wife's meal. Every prick I ever fed her deserved it and had it coming. I fed her my uncle, Tom, for molesting my niece. This is an awesome gig, dude. I stepped back, and sat down absorbing what he was saying. Listen, you only saw silhouettes. You can pretend this is just part of the relationship. You will be so happy. You love Rachel, right? I answered immediately, yes. I do. He smiled at me with that bro smile. He held out his glass to me. Then as your boss and future brother-in-law, we have your future to discuss. I was strong enough to forget this. I didn't want to end up like Tom and Larry. We cheer our glasses. Last week, we celebrated my promotion to executive vice president of sales. I made love to Rachel all night in our new home as we celebrated after she finished her meal. I owe all sorts of toys and I have the most beautiful wife in the world. A word to all of you out there, don't screw with me, or you may be her next meal. I will eat this cake. Hey, where are you going? Be sure to subscribe to my channel. Okay, so the story I'm about to tell you is going to sound completely crazy. But, as myself and the others that experienced it with me will assure you, it is entirely true. Anyway, my name is Connor. I have three very close friends named Sean, Kyle, and James. We all live in the Antigonish area of Nova Scotia. A few summers ago James was going to visit his grandparents in Craignish, Cape Breton for part of the summer, and invited the three of us to come with him. We hadn't had anything interesting planned for the summer, and it would only be about an hour and 15 minute drive from home. So we agreed to go on the trip. Kyle's sister Emily, who was a year younger than us, decided to come too. The rest of us were 15 at the time. When I say James' grandparents lived in Craignish, I mean they lived on a sort of back road in the area. James' grandma drove us there. There wasn't much room in the van, so I only brought what I felt necessary, a few pairs of clothes, a toothbrush, and my Game Boy Advance with a few games. I tried to take in as much of the land escape as I could on the drive, I was used to living in the middle of town so I liked seeing the sights for once. James, who was sitting next to me in the back seat, informed me that his grandma's name was Mary and his grandpa's name was Danny, so I'll be referring to them by those names. When we arrived at the house, it was already about 6 o'clock. Mary suggested that we settle in after we eat supper. Mary made mashed potatoes and ham, and we all sat down at the dinner table. After supper, we realized there were only two spare bedrooms in the house, but Danny told us there were two spare beds in the shed we could sleep in. Now the shed wasn't old and cramped like it may sound. It was more like a finished garage, so we would be comfortable. Sean and I agreed to sleep in the shed. The nights were very hot that summer and it would be cooler out there. James and Emily chose to sleep in the two spare bedrooms, and Kyle decided to sleep on the couch. Shortly after we had settled in, we went to bed. The first few days in Craignish were pretty chill. The second day there, we all drove into town and Mary showed us around. We stopped at the convenience store and each got a coke. Unlike Antigonish, 
This town seemed a lot more connected, I guess. Everyone seemed to know each other. I guess it was because it was a smaller community. On our fourth day there, we walked down to the beach to go swimming. It was a pretty long walk, but Mary and Danny were busy and none of us were able to drive. Anyway, I thought we needed the exercise. After walking for about half an hour, we arrived at the beach. It was about 6.30 pm now. We were swimming there for a couple of hours, and then I took a break. And that's when it started to get cold. Not like a cold breeze, there wasn't a breeze at all that day. It was just cold. It was unnatural, because like I said, it was a hot summer, and it didn't cool down at night. It was starting to get dark at this point, and that, combined with the sudden drop in temperature, let us know it was time to start walking home. The walk seemed to last forever, and as we walked on, it was getting colder and colder. I was really regretting not bringing a hoodie. By the time we made it back to the house, I could see my breath. We were all kind of freaked out about the sudden change in temperature, so we all decided to get ready for bed. It was a little early to go to sleep, so I decided to play my Game Boy for a while. I don't think I was three minutes into playing when my Game Boy died, and I was left in complete darkness, except for a bit of moonlight coming in the window. My Game Boy had been charged just the day before, and I hadn't been using it enough for it to run out of charge then. I was puzzled, then I thought about how fast it had gone from hot to freezing earlier, and felt a feeling of dread pass over me. Something wasn't right. I set my Game Boy in my bag and told myself I'd figure it out in the morning. After what I think was about 10 minutes, I felt myself drift off to sleep. I was woken by the screeching of some animal. It was like something I'd never heard before, like in between a human and a bull or something. I guess it didn't sound human, almost as if it was trying to sound like a human screaming but you could still make out that it was an animal. It sounded like it was right outside. I didn't want to move, but my curiosity got the better of me, and I walked to the window. The shed felt even colder than it had when I'd gone to bed. The window was a bit higher than I could reach, so I got a footstool and stood on it. I lifted my eyes up to the window, and my heart sank. There was something out there, standing on two legs and covered in fur. It fit the description of a werewolf that you'd see on TV. Then it turned around and stared right at me. I only saw its face for a split second before I ducked beneath the window, but I'll remember it for the rest of my life. It had the face of a dog, but with the snout of a pig, and red eyes that seemed to glow, it looked like they were glowing because they seemed to be illuminating its snout, as the snout had a red tint on it. I could see huge fangs at the sides of its mouth. When I backed up away from the window, I almost fell off the stool. I immediately closed the curtains and ran to the door to make sure it was locked. The screeching of the creature must have woken Sean up because the next thing I heard was him yelling what the heck is that noise? And I half ran, half crawled to the side of his bed and told him to be quiet. As I described what I saw outside, his eyes widened with fear. I knew he believed me because he knew I would never lie about something like that. I got back in my bed and hid under the covers. And then I listened. I could hear it moving around in the grass, and every few minutes it would let out another screech. I must have dozed off after that, because the next thing I knew, it was morning. I immediately tested the lights to see if they were working. They were fine. I got my Game Boy out of my bag and turned it on. It was working too. I was confused and thought that maybe the power dying and the drop in temperature was connected to that thing I had seen outside the night before. I turned my Game Boy off and set it back down. I sat on my bed thinking about everything for what must have been a few minutes, 
And then Sean woke up. We opened the door and started towards the house. Sean turned around and started to say something to me, but he immediately stopped and stared right past me, back at the shed. I turned around to see what he was so freaked out about, and I instantly felt the same feeling I had felt the night before when I looked out the window. The door of the shed had scratch marks on it. Any thought I might have had about it all being just a bad dream went away at that moment. I felt like just going into the house and forgetting about it, and even though the sun was up, I felt a little uneasy being outside. I started walking towards the house again, and Sean did the same. He must be thinking the same thing as I am, I thought. When we walked into the kitchen, everyone was already eating breakfast. Sleep well? Mary asked. Yeah? I lied. I looked at the clock on the stove. It was 8.45. We sat down at the table and didn't say anything about what had happened the night before. I was halfway through my bacon and eggs when Kyle broke the silence. Did anyone hear anything last night? I almost choked on the egg in my mouth. He continued on saying that he'd woken up at like 3 in the morning to the sound of some animal that he couldn't recognize, and how it had kept him awake for at least an hour. That was when I told them everything, about the power on my Game Boy, the screeching, the creature I had seen, the scratches on the door. Everyone looked at me like they were trying not to believe me but they knew I was telling the truth. Then James admitted that he had heard the noises too, but was too scared to look out the window. I would have thought that Mary and Danny would dismiss these stories as figments of our imagination, but even they looked concerned. We finished breakfast without talking about it anymore, and for the rest of the morning, we tried to forget about it. The day went on like any normal day after that. We didn't go anywhere but just chilled around the house all day. Then at about a quarter to seven in the evening, the others decided they were going to have a fire that night. I was a bit reluctant to agree to it, but I didn't want to ruin their fun. We started collecting sticks and got some hardwood from the pile behind the shed. Right when we were about to start the fire, storm clouds started to roll in. Shortly after that, it started to rain, and we all ran inside. Thunder came a few minutes later, and it was starting to get dark. We all sat in the living room talking and telling stories as if we were having the campfire indoors. About an hour after the storm started, the power went out. Mary ran and got candles from another room, and we lit them and started telling stories again. After a few other stories, James was telling a scary story when it started getting cold again. Mary and Danny were in bed when we got home the night before, so they didn't know how cold it got. But the rest of us knew exactly what was going on. It got cold way faster this time, though. Only about a minute and a half after the cold set in, I could already see my breath. Then I looked outside and the same feeling of dread washed over me once more. There were two red eyes staring at us through the window only about 30 feet away. Sean was sitting next to me on the couch, and I tapped him on the shoulder. He looked out the window and saw them too. At this point, everyone had realized what we were looking at and had seen the eyes for themselves. Then, as everyone stared at the window, there was a flash of lightning and in that instant, everyone saw it. It was the exact same creature I had seen. It let out a screech, and everyone was petrified with fear. Lightning flashed again, and this time it was at least 10 or 15 feet closer to us. Everyone just booked it out of the room, up to the stairs without thinking twice about it. We hid in Mary and Danny's room and listened, the window in the living room smashed open. Emily opened her mouth to scream but Kyle put his hand over her mouth to silence her. We could hear it moving around in the kitchen, knocking pots and pans off the stove. 
That's when Danny told us to slowly open the window, and he crawled to the bedside table to get the car keys. We opened the window and everyone climbed out one at a time and dropped down onto the roof of the porch. Everyone slid off the roof onto the ground. Normally I'd be too scared to jump off a roof, but right then I didn't really care. We ran to the van, and everyone got in within a few seconds. Danny tried to start the car, and it just wouldn't start. He tried everything, but it just wouldn't work. Mary said we should try to call 911 on our cell phones. That won't work I assured her. Everyone tried their phones anyway, and sure enough, none of them would turn on. I said we should all just forget about everything else and start running, and then maybe we could get to town and get help. No one wanted to be walking to town in the middle of the night with some creature following us, but nobody could come up with any better idea. We all jumped out of the van and sprinted as fast as we could away from the house. I caught a glimpse back at the house right before it vanished from my line of sight, and that thing was staring at us from the window we had jumped out of. That just made me run that much faster. About five minutes later we got tired of running and slowed down a bit, convinced we had lost it. For the rest of the way, we would walk for a bit, then someone would look back and think they saw something and we'd start running again for another few minutes or so. It felt like we'd been walking forever when finally we saw the lights of the convenience store and ran as fast as our legs could carry us to the door, thanking God that we had made it. Before I went inside, I looked back once more, and I saw the eyes. It started at me for a few seconds, and then the eyes went off to the side and disappeared, as if the creature had turned around and walked away. When I went into the store, I didn't tell the others what I'd seen, I didn't want to scare them any more than they already were. We explained to the guy behind the counter what had happened and that we needed to use the phone. He looked at us in disbelief, but since we all looked so shaken up he handed us the phone right away. Mary dialed 911 and told the police what had happened. They didn't sound like they believed her but told her that they would pick us up and let us sleep at the station that night, then they would drive us home and check the place out in the morning. They must have heard the fear in her voice. While she was on the phone, the rest of us noticed that it wasn't cold anymore. I didn't remember when it had gotten warm again because we were all too scared to think about that before, but I assumed it must have been when we had reached the town, because the power was on everywhere there. An officer picked us up and brought us to the station. They gave us a place to sleep and we went to bed right away. As I was falling asleep, I thought about everything that had happened. Then I drifted off. I woke several times during the night, unable to get restful sleep. I felt like that thing was watching me, or that it knew where I was. We all must be pretty paranoid, I thought. I woke up for good at 5 o'clock in the morning. Everyone else was still asleep. And I guess the sheriff thought of this as a golden opportunity to find out more about the creature, he asked me to sit down in his office. So I hear you were the first to see this creature? He asked. I nodded. He proceeded to ask me to describe the creature and where I had first seen it. We talked for about an hour and I explained everything that had happened. He just stared at me with a neutral expression while I talked like he didn't believe me or doubt me. Once we had finished talking, I walked out to the front of the building. Everyone was up at this point. We drove back out to the house with the sheriff and a few more officers. There were no signs of the creature, but the scratch marks on the door of the shed, smashed window, and tons of stuff ripped up inside the house showed that there had been something around there. The scratch marks puzzled the sheriff because they didn't match any animal anyone had seen before. After the police had done their search, they left and Sean, James, Kyle, Emily and I began packing up. 
Mary and Danley didn't want to make us stay any longer after what had happened. We put our stuff in the back of the van and said goodbye to Danny. We got in the van, and Mary was able to start it without any problems. James started talking to me about something, I don't really remember what it was, and we started moving. As we drove off, I took one last look at the house through the back window, and there it was. Standing at the edge of the woods, looking directly at the van. I locked eyes with the creature for a moment, and then it turned around and walked away. I remember thinking it was like it was saying goodbye in a way. That's the last time I ever saw it. And that's pretty much where our story ends because nothing has really happened since then. A few days after we all went home, the police searched the entire woods, there was no sign of the creature anywhere. James has been back to visit his grandparents several times since that summer, and neither Mary, Danny nor James have had any encounters with the creature. But, recently, I found an article that I think could explain our entire experience. Ever since people started immigrating to Craignish area in the 1700s, there have been reports of encounters with a certain spirit that draws energy from numerous sources to be able to exhibit a physical form. Encounters are usually preceded by a sudden drop in temperature and, in more recent cases, loss of power in various devices. The spirit usually shows itself as a large wolf boar hybrid that stands on two legs and has glowing red eyes. I know it's still out there, somewhere. Even when we can't see it, it's there, watching our every move, and at any moment, it could come back to terrorize us all. What do you call a werewolf that can't decide what to wear? A what to wear wolf? Be sure to subscribe to my channel. When I was young my mum used to leave me at my grandparents house all summer and come get me for school. It was a little town where most people knew my grandparents and since I didn't go to school there I didn't have any friends my age. But from my grandma's side, from a previous marriage, I had a bunch of older cousins. So, sometimes I stayed there. That side of the family was considerably wealthier, they had a big house, air conditioning, and cable. Even if I loved my grandpa a lot and loved to mess with his cologne and shaving creams, loved to spoil the dogs until they loved me and chase my grandma's chickens around the chicken coop. I always wanted to be at my cousin's place, they had legit bathrooms too. I was pretty close with my cousins since it was mostly girls and nobody really watched over us. We explored the woods and places nobody visited. We usually went to the little water canal and let the current drift us away because a tree had fallen and it formed a barricade, we never told anyone because the adults would be pissed. We had little turf wars with other kids and went about in our bikes. We had a lot of secret places and we always ran round having adventures. My cousin Laura was the oldest and I loved her because she was so cool. I really wanted to be like her. Laura had a really close friend that I also loved because she'd lend me cassettes and told me what was cool and made me feel really important, Sarah was super different from us. We were a bunch of tall brunettes and she stood up, ha ha, with her blonde hair and tiny stature. My cousin always made fun of her, pulling the tips of her hair, called her blondie and tickling her a lot, just good natured ribbing. As I grew older and so did they, Laura started to hang out with her friends more and Sarah would wave at me from afar as they went about their business. I started to see them less and less. I guess it wasn't fun being a babysitter for the whole summer. One summer I noticed that Sarah wasn't ever there which was strange since I was a baby Sarah was right beside Laura. 
So I asked my cousins what the deal was and they told me that Sarah wasn't welcomed at the house anymore and that Laura hated her. This was a shock to me, but I never asked why or what happened because at that moment one of the next door neighbors brought a puppy and I forgot about it. Some days Laura stayed and watched TV with us and made fun of us for still be playing with dolls and cooking with whatever we found, which included living things, sorry tadpoles, and shampoo or whatever I managed to steal from my grandpa. The next summer when my mum was visiting we were in front of my grandparents' place under the shade of the big coffee tree named that for the color of the leaves not because it was coffee related, reading my mum's old occult notebooks, she had a witch phase, eating watermelon and trying to avoid the ants. When Sarah appeared on her yellow rusty bicycle, she looked kinda sad and had like, a welt on her cheek. Laura didn't say hi to her but I did and my mom invited her to stay. Everyone had a blast Laura and Sarah acted like they used to. My mom let us play around with dough and made cookies. I and the rest of my cousins made deformed shapes that were supposed to be stars while Laura and Sarah made perfect round shapes and everyone ate too much. That was the last time I saw Sarah. My mom went back to work and left me with my grandparents as usual. I stayed at my aunt's as usual. A few days after that, I stayed over. I didn't usually sleep there but it was too late and my uncle's truck wasn't working so I just shared a bed with Riley. Sharing a bed with Riley was like sharing a bed with a dog, three fish, and a farty old man. She moved too much and her hands slapped around in the smell. I couldn't sleep and be in a bad mood. I heard a noise and froze hugging Riley's leg, she was three years older than me but that was still older than seven, like me, so she was in charge. I slapped her and she didn't wake up I even opened her eyes but she was in another world. I didn't go to investigate until I heard Laura's voice whispering. Relieved and with an idea in mind, I went out of the room. Laura wasn't alone and she was almost out the window. What are you doing? I said crossing my arms while trying to sound like an adult that wasn't wearing a Daffy Duck t-shirt, pink pants with holes in the knee and had some sense of authority. A guy older than Laura peeked from the other side, he laughed. Nothing, go back to sleep. Laura shooed me away but I wasn't going to go because I didn't want to sleep and because this seemed like fun. I'm gonna tattle if you don't take me with you. Laura made a face, whispered something to the guy and went to her room for a second before coming back and helping me over the window. I felt exhilarated, I never went out at night and with cool people. We walked under the street lights until we made it close to the side of the train tracks, I could tell by the noise of the train shaking the tracks as it went. I didn't know that part of town that well but knew it was closer to my grandparents house than Laura's since I always crossed the tracks to come to her house. We walked to the park and there we picked another girl and another older boy. The other two made fun of Laura for bringing me, that she was almost 18 but still hung with toddlers. I was mad at that. I wasn't a toddler. Laura said that I wasn't gonna be an issue. They lead us to an abandoned house some minutes away and there the guy that laughed at me made a fire close to a bench. Laura gave me her Walkman and told me not to bother them. She left me by the fire and threw her hoodie at me since it was kinda cold and went inside with her friends. It was late, the cassette was on the last song of Side A so I just flipped it. I was sleepy and I was used to sleeping outside but I was creeped out, I never slept outside the house without grandpa and the dogs. So I just listened to music and decided to wait awake for Laura. I fell asleep. I don't know what woke me up, it wasn't a sound or the cold but I jumped from the bench, 
turned to see if Laura had come back to take us home but she was still inside laughing. I made a face and cursed her, annoyed. I went back to sit on the bench and realized that the music had stopped so I took the Walkman out of my pocket and as I looked down I saw a figure. I looked up, near the fire someone was standing looking at me. I jumped startled again, no joke I almost swallowed my tongue and peed my pink pants. It was Sarah. But she didn't look like Sarah. Or at least not like the Sarah I had seen a few days back. So I screamed. Laura. Because I was scared and shaky and even if it was nothing at least I wouldn't be alone. She didn't come outside, she just yelled what? From inside. I screamed her name again and this time she and the rest of her group came out. I never took my eyes away from Sarah so I saw her smile when they made it out. It was wrong. Laura called my name but I didn't move. Laura's friends went up to Sarah. Laura walked to me and took my hand and I turned away from Sarah. I didn't notice until then, with the guys walking towards the dying fire but Sarah didn't have a shadow. Laura, I don't. Laura's friends started calling Sarah names I didn't understand and making fun of her. At the time I didn't know what a slow was but that was definitely what they were yelling at her. The guys got closer to her and Laura squeezed my hand. I looked at her face and she looked upset but she didn't stop them. The mood shifted, and then they were talking like they were friendly, inviting her inside. I couldn't see her face since they towered over her but I heard her say I know a great place, you guys should follow me. And like magic, everyone followed her. Laura pulled me along but I wanted to go home. Laura, I'm scared. I want my mom. I remember exactly saying that because I felt stupid saying it. My mom wasn't in town but I wanted her to get me in that instant. I didn't want to go back to Laura's. It's okay. She muttered and kept walking. Sarah was talking to the guys telling them that it wasn't funny what they did to her and that they should be sorry. Everyone said sorry to her quickly but sloppily. Laura looked dazed. Her pupils were so big. That doesn't count, does it Farah? She looked unhinged, her eyes locked on mine and I felt cold, her eyes changed glowed like a cat's. When I said nothing her eyes hardened but she kept walking. My heart was beating so hard I thought I was going to die. Laura, please let's go. I pulled her hand but she kept walking and pulling me from my wrist. Sarah looked like a grainy picture, fuzzy and shadowy around the edges. Looking directly at her made my head hurt. Laura. She looked down at me and she was crying but there was a smile on her face. I started crying and I felt my throat tight. I noticed that we weren't as close to Sarah but she called Laura and she would walk closer. Slower than the rest of them but she still walked. The more it stopped looking like Sarah the more it hurt to look at it, so I stopped. I didn't know what to do, all I could see was blurred by my tears and I felt so hopeless. I screamed but nobody came running to help. I never stopped screaming. I don't want to sound like I was heroic or that I wouldn't abandon Laura. I tried to, but Laura wouldn't let go of my arm I pulled and scratched her hand trying to make her let go and that's when I heard the train. The bottom fell out of my little world. I suddenly knew with perfect clarity, where were we walking? I cleaned the snot from my face and I don't know. I just wanted to get away, knowing that Laura was trying to get away too but she physically couldn't. I knew that whatever the thing was doing it didn't affect me but it started when she looked at Laura. By the time we made it to the tracks, I stopped screaming. My hands trembled as I pulled the cassette out and turned it for the right side. I don't remember what song played I just know I turned the volume all the way up until it hurts to hear. 
I showed her so she let go of my hand and I told her to carry me on her back, it was difficult since she never stopped walking, I fell and scraped my knees on the big rocks. It stung, I could hear the train coming closer and closer in front of us, the tracks vibrating harder. I tried to make it quick, put the headphones on her and hugged her so I didn't accidentally fall. I covered her eyes with my hands and slowly she stopped walking, I could feel the train was really close so I opened my eyes. The thing was tall and dark, like an animal that tried to stand on two legs. I would describe it more like a werewolf. The body shape at least but lanky, skin and bones with a pale face. Eyes too big for its face and reflective like a feline. Laura's three friends stood with the thing, looking up and touching it. The train made a loud noise and the light shone on all of them I pulled Laura's hair hard with one of my hands to the other side of the rails, I didn't recognize the place but I knew that on that side I could get to my grandfather. The motorman sounded the horn, it was so close to us. Laura moved but she stumbled and I fell on the rocks again I heard the train hit them. It was the worst sound I ever heard in my life. With my hands off her face, Laura stood and grabbed me and she ran pulling me along. We ran until we made to my grandparents house, we jumped over the metal lattice and climbed inside the house through my bedroom window. We made a lot of noise so my grandmother opened the door with her wooden cane raised high about to hit whatever intruder she imagined awaited. As soon as I saw her I started the waterworks. I cried and cried until my eyes felt swollen and I told her what I saw. Laura told grandma that I had a nightmare and that she decided to bring me back. I went to sleep. And when I woke up my grandpa was in the room with me, sitting on a chair drinking coffee, one of the dogs was sleeping on my bed, no dogs were allowed inside. Ever. But I didn't comment on it, that day grandma made my suitcase and grandpa took me to the bus station and a friend of the family accompanied me. At night I closed the curtain, scared that the thing would be running beside the bus. The next summer I stayed at one of my mum's friend's house. The next with my aunt, my mum's sister. I did go back but I never saw my cousins and I never crossed the train tracks again. Well, not conscious.